I just need to get rid of myself at the corner of the screen there. That's that's good. Right. There are several different ways to collect air graphs. You could choose to study the designs of the forms and the technicalities of the printing, or restrict yourself to collecting only those original forms which have postal indicator on the reverse to denote payment of the fee. I've chosen to concentrate mainly on illustrated air graphs and where possible, original forms for these, as I think they introduce a general audience to the subject in a non-intimidating way and often give a hint of the Allied servicemen's well-known wry sense of humour. Illustrated air graphs are also a rich source for thematic collectors. As we tour the areas of use, we shall meet some individual artists. This modern postcard shows a contemporary poster explaining them in a nutshell. Letters on film, saving space, saving waste. Before going on to view a selection of illustrated air graphs, we shall spend a minute or two looking at the air graph service and how it worked. A machine for microfilming correspondence was invented as early as 1928 with a view to being used in banking and commercial service. Charles Case saw the possibilities for postal use, particularly to save large sums on transatlantic routes. A new company, Airgraphs Limited, was formed by Eastman Kodak, Imperial Airways and Pan American Airways. It was demonstrated in England in 1938 and 39, but it was shelved when war broke out. As the war progressed, the fall of France and the entry of Italy into the war resulted in mail to the Middle East and India being disrupted, and delays of 11 weeks by sea and eight weeks by air were not uncommon. The aircraft idea was reconsidered in the late autumn of 1940. The post office, in conjunction with Eastman Kodak, set up the new service. The first aircrafts were received in London from the Middle East through Cairo on the 13th of May 1940. Ah, you ask, why didn't the service start from London? It was simply a question of logistics. The microfilming machines could be sent out by air, but the processing and printing plants were so large and heavy that it had to go by sea. The first acceptance date for mail from London to Cairo was August the 15th. This is how the system worked. Messages were written on a special form, 11 inches by eight and a half inches. This was obtainable free from post offices. All the instructions were on the back of the form, but we don't know, we don't need to go into all that, it is very complicated. Um, there was a place to put a threatening stamp and also a warning that the address should be written as large as possible. It will become obvious why later. The forms were centrally sorted into batches for specific destinations, given a number, then filmed. Each roll of film held 1,600 images and went into a container four inches by four inches by one inch. The container in the film weighed about five and a half ounces as against 35 pounds or two mailbags worth of letters. The films were then flown to their destination where they were processed and printed. The resulting air graphs size approximately four and a half by five and a half, which is approximately what you'll be getting on a normal computer screen. They were folded, put into a window envelope to show the address panel, and then posted on in either the civil or military mails. This is a very early example, having been sent only 10 days after the first acceptance date in Cairo. It was processed and posted in London on the 15th of May, a total transit time of 19 days. The forms were retained by the post office until receipt of the film was confirmed, which meant that they could be re-photographed and resent if they were lost in transit, hence the numbering. If they had to be reprinted, the delivered versions had reprint, printed or stamped on the back of them. They're very, very hard to find. I haven't got any. There were various designs of air graph envelopes. The windows were not glazed, they were just holes in the envelope. Oblong windows, rounded corners, oval windows, etc. Eventually in England, the whole process became mechanised, with the logo and dispatch cancellations being printed in one operation, and the air graph being folded and inserted mechanically. Some envelopes were very crude and of poor quality paper, particularly the Egyptian ones. <clears throat> Here is an example of, of a form returned to the sender. Malta never had an aircraft service. The return slips used were similar to those used for mail rejected by censors. 
And in this case, the postage was refunded, as you can see by the R's next to the stamp and on the return slip. Some aircrafts were delivered without envelopes. In Egypt, the sides were sealed with small adhesive strips. Keaton, who is the most comprehensive reference for the aircraft service, states that this was done early in the service. However, both the examples here date from mid-1944, so it did go on quite a bit later. Canada sealed their graphs with two strips of adhesive at the edges. Neither method offered very much privacy, and the air graphs must have been very prone to getting caught up in transit, caught up uh, uh, together in transit, because as you can see, uh, with the adhesive strips at the side, it, was, it would open like a pocket at the top there and there. So another aircraft could easily slip inside it. At last, something illustrated. A Great Britain 1943 Christmas aircraft, original form, and a delivered version showing civilians and service personnel pulling a cracker. Original forms are all much harder to find than examples of the delivered aircrafts. The same form, this time delivered in another non-envelope format. If air freight space were available, usually on transatlantic routes, the actual forms might be sent. They were folded to show the address and then stapled at each end. It was surprisingly difficult to find. I didn't realise that, that this was how this particular on, uh, air graph had been sent. When I got it, I thought that it was a nice thing to have because it was written on and I hadn't come across uh, written air graph forms like that before. And it wasn't until I had a really good look at it, despite thinking that it was a bit scruffy. Um, I looked at it and found that there were staple holes in it. And you can actually see the smallest, uh, less distinct staple holes further down, but I, I've put squares around the top two, which you can actually notice. The addressee was an interesting person. Major Michael Gibson Horrocks, fought in North Africa and Italy. He was promoted temporary major on the 14th of November, 1943. Hence the congratulations in the air graph. He was taken prisoner by the Germans in Tunis with about 150 of his fellow soldiers and he contracted dysentery in the appalling conditions. When the Germans decided to take the prisoners back to Italy, the sick ones remained with only a sergeant to guide them to, or to guard them. He managed to persuade the guard that his family in Italy was missing him and the guard left his post. The Major then found a deserted German ambulance and drove it back through the German lines to rejoin the British troops. <clears throat> the sender, Private Joyce Macken, C Company, was based at 18 Eaton Place, but so far I've been unable to trace what organisation was based there in 1943. I wonder if anybody knows the answer. Um, 18 Eaton Place is now a very posh apartment, so nothing official. This original form came from the Bournemouth War Services Comforts Fund. It's a very attractive and detailed drawing. However, it might have lost some definition when reduced and reprinted. I've yet to find an actual air graph. There were 450 employees of the Birmingham head post office serving in the forces, and Mr. VJ Pinnegar, a union official, kept in contact with many of them. He received many replies, one of which is shown here. A well-known name to philatelists, Francis J. Field, adapted several GB standard forms. This is a GB standard Christmas form. This is also the only air graph form which was issued complete with a, st a threepenny stamp impression on the back and is therefore postal stationery. Notice that Father Christmas's whip is a victory V and after it, you've got the Morse code V sign. Francis Field had contacts around the world who supplied him with material, including driver SG Crop who did all sorts of military insignia. He was very good at insignia, but he wasn't actually very good at apostrophes. You'll notice on each of those. <clears throat> there are quite a few of those around, lots of different ones. Here are two 
GB aircraft sent to Southeast Asia Command, and there's a parachute for anybody who might be interested in parachutes. On the left, V for Victory is in, oh, yes, on the left, V for Victory is in Santa Sack, there. And lots of gifts are being dropped over Europe. We can see the Eiffel Tower, and we can see windmills there. And we can see a plane taking off. We can see some mistletoe as well, and a little bit of holly on the Christmas pudding. On the right, look for the Victory Vs in the candle holders, and also the Vs in Morse code on the bells. We now move to a group of aircrafts from abroad, starting with Middle East forces, MEF, which was mainly Egypt. These two Christmas 1941 examples both show address panels at the bottom, as appeared on the earliest plane aircraft forms. This was soon found to be awkward and the panel was moved to the top. Here's another original form, this time from HMS Stag, which was later renamed HMS Saunders. This was a training base at, uh, on Egypt's Little Bitter Lake. There was a big concentration of logistics, training and maintenance facilities in that area. Um, a lot of aircraft came up through that area, uh, having been delivered, crated into um, into South Africa or uh, further around the coast. And they, they were put together in that area and then flown up into Egypt, into the upper part of Egypt. A rough interf interpretation of the signal flags, <clears throat> though it's not absolutely 100%, is I am dragging my anchor, which he is. I am altering course to port, which he could be because he is pulling the reins. I require a pilot and do not pass ahead of me. Also note that he carries a brush and a bucket. We all know why. And he has a post no bill sticker on his stern. <clears throat> Here are two more naval types. On the left, HMS Klo, which was damaged by a German aircraft off Mersey in 1941, later rescued survivors from HMS Jaguar of Sidi Barani in 1942. Those of you who are familiar with the, um, with the North Africa Theatre of War will know where those places are. As with many aircrafts, the focus of these is not very sharp. And this is a good example of, of why people were told to write as large and as clearly as they could. This is even blown up quite a bit, is still quite hard to read. Detailed illustrations often reduce poorly, as you can see there. 1941, we've got a convoy of greetings. Um, this is an unlisted design in, in Keaton's book, although it is similar. There are, others, uh, there are others with pairs of ships, as there are others very similar to this, and navy ones with the crown sign in the middle. HMS Vindictive was converted from a cruiser to a repair ship and served as a base ship during the Norwegian campaign, then with South, the South Atlantic Fleet during 1940 and 41, and then in the Mediterranean Fleet in 1943-44. Unfortunately, we can't see a date on that. We can't see that clearly. RAF Christmas 1941. Now, this is a sad story. <clears throat> Somewhere I have got a delivered version of this aircraft and it has eluded me. It's gone into hiding and I can't find it, but I've left a space for it. So when I find it, it will go right there. Here's another standard greetings time. This time from my dad serving in the Desert Air Force in North Africa to mum in Hull the much bombed East Coast town, allegedly East Coast town. Um, it's actually 15 to 20 miles inland, depending on where you want to paddle. Um, the statistics for Cairo, for anybody who really wants to know numbers, there were from Cairo, prints made in London from Cairo, there were 65,913,473 prints made in London from Cairo. This is one of the biggest areas. Um, those were the forces ones. There were over 2 million civilian ones as well from the same place. 
looking at the other air graph on, on here, on the right, the homegrown item, it's unclear how the illustration was done. The stalk looks like a lino cut or a wood cut, but the horizontal shading and the palm tree look hand drawn. <clears throat> The 1943 Spitfires and Palms design was also used as an air letter. This air graph came from a member of 72 Squadron, which was nicknamed the Basuto Land Squadron, because in both world wars, it was the recipient of aircraft donated by the people of Basuto Land, now Lesotho, of course. The design was also used on a greetings card in two colours. Often with window envelopes, uh, if one gets them with an item, one has no guarantee, particularly with the air graphs where the window is smaller, one has no guarantee that the envelope that arrives with the air graph is the one in which it was actually dispatched. It can just have been put in there by a dealer who had a spare envelope. Uh, in this instance, it's very nice because the window envelope is tied to the address panel on the card by both the RAF sensor mark and the FPO date stamp. So we know that that card belongs to that envelope. Here are two standard types, general forces and RAF versions. You see from the general Middle East forces and the RAF version there. You'll notice that on the RAF version, the camel has sneezed or being a camel, it might have spat. There is another printing of the RAF version uh, which doesn't have those lines. The design was also used on an air letter. Now for our first diversion. Meet Private Kerman and his daughter, Barbara. This series of air graphs from Private Kerman to his little girl, Barbara, begins on the 20th of December, 1941, with greetings for her third birthday and continues until November, 1943. Initially, he sent her letters illustrated by Disney characters, but when he got to Z in April, he continued just using Disney designs. The address these are sent to in Cranbrook Avenue is only about a mile and a half from where I'm sitting but we don't at this moment know anything about Private Kerman. These have all come through a dealer in Bridlington, so I think he's just been breaking a big collection recently. These were the first of the letters that I'd, I've managed to get. Now he's dated this 6th of the 1st 1941, but it's only a few days away from the 11th of the 1st 42, and I think that was a slip of the pen. Quite often when one writes something in January, one inadvertently puts the previous year's date, especially if one hasn't written very much in the interim period. So I think that was actually January 40, 42, 41, sorry, 42 rather. Why would he suddenly go back? Or why would he leave a year's gap? Owen P was one of the dwarfs and with Mickey Mouse saying, please brush my hair, mum. R with Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket, of course, was Pinocchio's conscience. And a T with Pluto. It's designed on Pluto, but I think they must have had a dog called Judy. And there's Z with Sleepy the Dwarf. Now he passes on to big groups of Disney characters. One wonders whether he traced these from film magazines which might have been sent out to him, or whether he was just a very co good copier. But some of these are, are really good illustrations. Still with a nod to Disney, but here he's saying, hope you're looking after mum and the donkey at Hornsey. Hornsey is really our nearest, uh, our nearest resort. And he's saying to mum, who must be called Sophie. Did you enjoy walking alongside the donkey? But please don't start telling me that you actually rode one. Pinocchio again, this time with Geppetto, who was his maker. Geppetto wanted him to be a little boy. And in, in this picture, he hasn't got any strings. And also there's the admonition to eat more carrots. Remember being told to eat more carrots so that you could see in the dark? Goofy and Clara Bell dancing. Try this with mum. And Donald Duck joins the army. Donald's a soldier now. Two rather different ones. 
November 1943, looking forward into 44. This is the first mention of boys' names, and I wonder whether these were, uh, were younger brothers. Uh, we have nothing to tell us. And the old fashioned Christmas greeting is to his wife. Rather a nice drawing. And you can see, which I haven't mentioned on the others, but you might have noticed it, you can see a strip of sellotape down the side. All of these had strips of sellotape down the sides of them and still have. Um, I haven't found a way yet of getting it off without taking some of the emulsion off. Unlike most of my other aerographs, in fact, all of them, um, all these have three pinholes there, there, and there. And I don't think it's something that's happened later. I think it's something that, that's happened in the printing process or in the, um, you know, the, the pulling of the material through the machines process, but I haven't seen it before. But some of them have been cut down. You can see that this hasn't been cut down exactly straight, but the sellotape doesn't turn around and go onto the back. So they might've been stuck together so they would go concertina fashion. They had also at some stage been stuck down in a photograph album. So there was a lot of very thick, very low quality gray paper on the back, which I had to take off very carefully because otherwise the, um, when scanning them, they came up with very big dark colored marks on them, which detracted. So I've had a go, but I'd, I might find a way to get cello tape off without taking the emulsion off at some later stage. Let's go back to the main story. British North Africa forces. The first army landings in North Africa took place in November 1942, but the aircraft service with the UK didn't begin until March and April 1943, after a processing station had been established in Algiers. Here's an unlisted type, quite a nice complicated one with an RAF logo in the middle and then a hand-drawn one, poor soldier standing out in the rain, dreaming of sitting in front of a fire with his warm slippers and his cat on his knee. We all need a cat on our knee, don't we? Two more standard types, the goat charmer and a group of servicemen. This is one of those where the envelope logo and postmark are all printed in one process, as you can see at the top. This is looking across the strait to Gibraltar. This one has been very, very severely cut down. It's very much narrower than all the others. The, the Gibraltar item to show how inaccurately cut some of the printed rolls could be. You'll see at the top, there's a little bit of another air graph underneath. And you can also see the very diagonal cut at the bottom. Um, with the ones, apart from the Kerman ones, which we were just looking at, all the others, the sides are straight, the physical sides are straight. So if they look lopsided, it's the print. They were printed on, on strips of paper, so the sides are going to be true all the time, though the aircraft themselves might not be. Five, six, seven searchlight companies served extensively in GB before being deployed to North Africa, including some places in East Yorkshire, including Hornsey, where we were looking at the donkey a few minutes ago. I've highlighted the searchlight here and, and enlarged it for you to look at. And you don't really get an idea of the scale of it from that, but if I show you a postcard, that's the size of one of those searchlights. Moving on to the central Mediterranean forces. After the invasion of Sicily and subsequently Italy, processing was continued in Algiers for all CMF mail until Naples was captured and a processing station set up there from June the 6th, 1944. There were two types of this standard CMF Christmas design, and it's one of the easiest ones to find. There are lots of these around. Um, the, uh, the original form itself is not so easy to find, but the air graph itself is. Um, there were two types here. One has a broken holly leaf, and I was very happy to find that whereas my original form has a broken holly leaf, my received version has the complete holly leaf. So you can see both versions there. Two standard types here, each showing the path of the Eighth Army from Egypt to Italy and showing the different, different battles coming through Libya, Tunisia, Sicily, and then into Italy. Same thing here. And walking over a swastika 
you notice. Soldier in a Jeep here, doubling as a knight on a charger, and the homemade victory wish. One here from 214 Transport Company, Royal Army Service Corps, as you can see, and a nice hand-drawn one on the right. When in Civvy Street, we used to say, here's mud in your eye. Now, here in Italy, there's mud everywhere. Italy becomes a stocking full of gifts on the left while there's a poor squad is sitting there thinking, when is he going to get home? This year, next year, sometime, never. The aircraft on the left looks very dull and bleak and uninviting. It is actually a casino where, of course, the, uh, the monastery on the top of the, the hill was nearly blasted out of existence during the fighting. The one on the right is an Indian, uh, is an Italian, sorry, standard type. Then we see battle honours for the Duke of Carrick's own Ayrshire Yeomanry. It's a very nice bird in the middle of it, and there, there's their logo. And on the left, ten corps is coming. Christmas is coming, Adolf. So, heartiest Christmas wishes, and not to Adolf. On the left, a hand-drawn design, and on the right, a unit type. AMES is Air Ministry Exper Experimental Station. That was a radar station. It's a request to the Forces Favourites programme for have, having I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas played. And it looks like they were successful because it's got a tick and it says Christmas Day on it. So that was presumably broadcast on Christmas Day. Two designs here featuring country cottages and servicemen thinking of home. <clears throat> Quite nicely drawn those. I suspect this one was a unit one. Part of that might have been, part of that might have been hand drawn and part of it might have been a unit one, not really sure. Now for another diversion. The next group of aircrafts were all drawn by Private William of Oak for various family members during his progress with the MEF in 1942, through to his time in Italy with the Central Mediterranean Forces in 1944. The first shows his impression of the quantity of stores needed to keep the army on the move. The second one shows him running to the YMCA to get away from the approaching dust storm. He managed quite a lot of detail in the first one, and I think it's worth showing you the detail because he, had, he did pretty good perspective too. What you're seeing on your screen there will be a little bit larger than it was in real life when he drew it on the form, but I think, I think he's done very well there. I suspect that this is an offer, officer and this is another rank. Here we have the convoy advancing and they seem to be leaving an awful lot of rubbish behind. I don't think that would be allowed in the forces nowadays. The second one, there was an annotation on the back of this saying that it was a Mussolini monument built to commemorate the construction of the road between Derna and Tobruk. And if you look at it closely, you'll see that it's got a lot of shell holes on it and a lot of wrecked vehicles around it. That um, monument doesn't exist anymore. It got destroyed completely. The burning sands sometimes turn to mud. And this was Mr. Voke or Corporal Voke going into his tent in the evening. One here to his nephew down by the Nile and another one, a scene in camp. I like this one. To become a casualty, just stop on the road. Of course, you, you were prone to getting a shot at by passing aircraft. 
this chicken is asking itself the age old question. Why did I cross the road? The army will brew up anywhere. Even if it means stopping on the road and staying close together in a convoy. Trucks avoiding the road patrol and Uncle Bill invading Italy. Poor man, he's all on his own. Hope he took some friends with him. And then of course, a very laudable sentiment, when in doubt, brew up and a diversion on the road to Rome. The viaduct is completely US, doesn't work at all. And the last one of this section, our aircraft attacked transport. I'll say they did. And the harvest of landmines here, when I first looked at this, I thought, apart from the landmines that have been pulled out here, I thought that this looked like a little bit of somebody's exhaust system, like a silencer falling off a truck. But people who've looked at it have said, no, it's some sort of grenade or, uh, you know, that can be thrown and it's got a handle on it. It's a stick grenade of some sort. So a really good harvest of mines there. Returning to the main story, we now go to India. This was a rich source of illustrated air graphs. The service began in Bombay in February 1942. The form on the left slipped out of alignment during filming and the corner became very crumpled. But you can see the cuts on this. So you can see that that is actually the air graph itself moving, the form moving as it was photographed. And the world is shown as a giant Christmas pudding. On the right, there's a serviceman using his bayonet to cut up a pudding watched by a tiger and a snake and a local beauty whilst a monkey pel pelts them with nuts. There's also a plane coming in there. And this was an RAF type. Then we have two enlisted designs. The one on the left from a major in the anti-tank regiment and on the right, a rather plain Christmas 1942 one. Then we move on to Christmas 1944, an original form and the delivered version. Here we've got Santa pulling victory out of his sack. Now that's in the position where you would normally get a sensor mark. I haven't actually said anything about sensor marks, but you may have noticed some sensor marks on, on the earlier air graphs. Um, the dedicated air graph sensor mark was, particularly in India, was this little square one, well, oblong one, which should have been in that position there, but of course it's been filled up by Santa. And at the bottom of that one, we've got a list of destinations to which air graphs could be sent. All sorts of interesting places, including British forces in Iceland, Nigeria, Gold Coast, Sierra Leone, all over the place. And from India, postage was three annas. And as it says there, the aircraft must be unit censored before dispatch. And here again, RAF Postal Service and RAF Welfare. A couple of Indian rope trick ones there. Santa, unable to find a chimney, comes down by magic rope much to everybody's astonishment. Rather than the rope, some travellers preferred a magic carpet, even if one of them was a customs declaration form. So this was just declaring lots of good wishes being sent from the RAF in India. And here we have another original form, plus the delivered version of the air graph. This is trying to stay cool in the Indian heat. And we see again the RF Postal Service and Welfare on the bottom as we did on the previous one. There are probably very few people now who remember the sender who was flying officer CRS Moon, known to us as Charles. He was a knowledgeable, well-respected and well-liked member of the whole philatelic society in the 70s and 80s, and was a big encouragement to those of us who were only just getting started. Very helpful to anybody who's interested in, in wartime material. Here's another design which also appeared on an air letter. This is troops from different areas. And you can see 
from the different headgear, which areas they came from. Here's an unlisted design for Christmas 1944, a very attractive one, but not in the book. It, this is one of those that I always want to colour in, particularly around the candle. In 1944, the Illustrated Weekly News of India held a competition to design a Christmas aircraft. This winning design showed scenes in England and India with what we presume is a homecoming troop ship sailing up the English Channel past the White Cliffs of Dover. Notice how the shading has resulted in a muddy looking print. Whilst this looks very good on the form, you can see the shading in there. The actual delivered version comes out looking very, very blurred, but it's just because of the shading. It isn't because it's, uh, because it's dirty. It is reproduced uh, very poorly. The second prize winner adopted a somewhat different style. A cherry Christmas and a Chappy New Year. I've often used that particular slide or that particular um, air graph as a signing off thing, a, a, a signing off sheet for World War II presentations with societies, but it makes it a good thing, particularly if it's in the latter part of the year. We finish with a few assorted items from other areas, various areas here. Two drawings, I've got two more of these, but none of them have got a clear date. Uh, that one hasn't even got an FPO on it. The date isn't clear, but that was FPO 532, which was in Tunisia in 1942 through to February 44. I think that's rather an, an appealing drawing, even if he has got the eye wrong on the left hand side. Little boys, obviously, enjoying his train set. South Africa favoured fairly plain designs, some with verses. Here's another one. And we enlarge the verse at the bottom. Keep your chins up, friends in Blighty. Keep your thumbs up, hold them tightly, but chiefly keep those home fires burning for pretty soon I'll be returning. Persia and Iraq force, known as Pay Force, generated these two hand-drawn cartoons from Lance Corporal W.H. Smith, nothing to do with the uh, with the news agents, we don't think. They were both sent on the same day. One to, it looks like his son, and the other to his wife. The squad is drill sergeant is berating them. The human brain is a wonderful invention. It starts working when you gets up, and the minute you comes on parade, it stops. Then there's a soldier lounging on the dockside with his kit bag, being observed from the bridge of a ship going to Blighty. See, it's, it says Blighty on its front. He won't come, he swears it's another dream. British General, General Hospital 61 was in Shaiba, Iraq from August 1941 to June 1946. <clears throat> Going now to New Zealand, the first New Zealand civilian aircraft from 1943 was sent to England. Notice the Maori emblem in the middle and the enlarged version. Unfortunately, this just comes where the air graph was folded to go in the envelope. So that's why he's got a white line across, across his middle. That's the crease in the, in the emulsion. <clears throat> the second New Zealand civilian Christmas air graph, 1944. The New Zealand, uh, New Zealand had overprinted the three halfpenny centennial stamp with 10 pence for use on air graphs. We, then the rate was reduced to five pence as explained here. When I was a child, Kaya Ora was a brand of soft drink you often bought in cartons in cinemas. And there he is. The quirky advertisements, which you can still find on YouTube if you want to look them up, are now considered very politically incorrect as they feature a cartoon coloured child being followed by animals along a beach. New Zealand again. A hapless group of Germans from a crashed vehicle are trying to thumb a lift. You'll see the swastikas on the wheels. I think they're on a hiding to nothing though. Unfortunately for them, the car is being driven by Churchill and contains Stalin, de Gaulle and Eisenhower. No amount of magnification will clarify, clarify the signpost up there, but I suspect it probably includes Berlin. The 
Polish forces produced many, many designs, um, most of which one finds going from GB out to troops. Um, here are four different ones. They usually contained either a Polish flag or the eagle on the globe. So they, did, they did a lot for Easter as well as for Christmas. <clears throat> Very nice though to get these two items. This is an original form and we've got the analogy of the swooping eagle coming in for the kill and the black parachute, the paratrooper coming in. And here, this one's a particularly good one because it's actually being sent by a soldier in the Central Mediterranean forces being sent to New Zealand. So this is very unusual. I was very pleased to get that. That's one of the things that I found at London 22. And finally, a hand-drawn aircraft to an address familiar to collectors reminds us of what we all share. Philately, the hobby of kings. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, Daphne. That was um, absolutely superb. The, uh, uh, quite so much there. Um, really some very exciting stuff. Um, I was particularly interested to see the parachute ones. Oh, I have one, uh, but not the other I, one. I know you've got that one, though, haven't you? Yes, I've got the Polish one, yes, but not the, the 1944 Christmas one. Have you uh, not? No. Oh, I thought you'd have that. No, no, it's the other way no. around. So I've got the oh, right. Yes. But, um, and uh, it was lovely to see it. Amazing by the art.